Part Two of The Red-Headed League by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two. Well, I thought over the matter all day, and by evening I was in low spirits again, for I had quite persuaded myself that the whole affair must be some great hoax or fraud, though what its object might be I could not imagine. It seemed altogether past belief that any one could make such a will, or that they would pay such a sum for doing anything so simple as copying out the Encyclopedia Britannica. Vincent Spaulding did what he could to cheer me up, but by bedtime I had reasoned myself out of the whole thing. However, in the morning I determined to have a look at it anyhow, so I bought a penny bottle of ink, and with a quill pen and seven sheets of foolscap paper I started off for Pope's court. Well, to my surprise and delight, everything was as right as possible. The table was set out ready for me, and Mr. Duncan Ross was there uh, to see that I got fairly to work. He started me off upon the letter A, and then he left me, but he would drop in from time to time uh, to see that all was right with me. At two o'clock he bade me good day, complimented me upon the amount that I had written, and locked the door of the office after me. This went on day after day, Mr. Holmes, and on Saturday the manager came in and planked down four golden sovereigns for my week's work. It was the same next week, and the same the week after. Every morning I was there at ten, and every afternoon I left at two. By degrees Mr. Duncan Ross took to coming in only once of a morning, and then, after a time, he did not come in at all. Still, of course, I never dared to leave the room for an instant, for I was not sure when he might come, and the billet was such a good one and suited me so well that I would not risk the loss of it. Eight weeks passed away like this, and I had written about abbots and archery and armor and architecture and attica, and hoped with diligence that I might get on to the bees before very long. It cost me something in foolscap, and I had pretty nearly filled a shelf with my writings, and then suddenly the whole business came to an end. To an end? Yes, sir, and no later than this morning. I went to my work as usual at ten o'clock, but the door was shut and locked, with a little square of cardboard hammered on to the middle of the panel with a tack. Here it is, and you can read for yourself. He held up a piece of white cardboard about the size of a sheet of notepaper. It read in this fashion, The Red-Headed League is Dissolved, October 9, 1890. Sherlock Holmes and I surveyed this curt announcement and the rueful face behind it until the comical side of the affair so completely overtopped every other consideration that we both burst out into a roar of laughter. "'I cannot see that there is anything very funny,' cried our client, flushing up to the roots of his flaming head. "'If you can do nothing better than laugh at me, I can go elsewhere.' "'No, no,' cried Holmes, shoving him back into the chair from which he had half risen. "'I really wouldn't miss your case for the world. It is most refreshingly unusual.' But there is, if you will excuse my saying so, something just a little funny about it. Pray, what steps did you take when you found the card upon the door? I was staggered, sir. I did not know what to do. Then I called at the offices round, but none of them seemed to know anything about it. Finally I went to the landlord, who is an accountant living on the ground floor, and I asked him if he could tell me what had become of the Red-Headed League. He said that he had never heard of any such body. Then I asked him who Mr. Duncan Ross was. He answered that the name was new to him. "'Well,' said I, "'the gentleman at number four. "'What, the Red-Headed Man?' "'Yes. Oh,' said he, "'his name was William Morris.' 
He was a solicitor and was using my room as a temporary convenience until his new premises were ready. He moved out yesterday. Where could I find him? Oh, at his new offices. He did tell me the address. Yes, 17 King Edward Street, near St. Paul's. I started off, Mr. Holmes, but when I had got to that address, it was a manufactory of artificial kneecaps, and no one in it had ever heard of either Mr. William Morris or Mr. Duncan Ross. And what did you do then? asked Holmes. I went home to Saxe-Coburg Square, and I took the advice of my assistant, but he could not help me in any way. He could only say that if I waited, I should hear by post. But that was not quite good enough, Mr. Holmes. I did not wish to lose such a place without a struggle, so as I had heard that you were good enough to give advice to poor folk who were in need of it, I came right away to you. "'And you did very wisely,' said Holmes. "'Your case is an exceedingly remarkable one, and I shall be happy to look into it. From what you have told me, I think that it is possible that graver issues hang from it than might at first sight appear.' "'Grave enough,' said Mr. Jabez Wilson. "'Why, I have lost four pounds a week.' "'As far as you are personally concerned,' remarked Holmes, "'I do not see that you have any grievance against this extraordinary league. "'On the contrary, you are, as I understand, richer by some thirty pounds, "'to say nothing of the minute knowledge which you have gained "'on every subject which comes under the letter A. "'You have lost nothing by them.' "'No, sir, but I want to find out about them.' and who they are, and what their object was in playing this prank, if it was a prank upon me. It was a pretty expensive joke for them, for it cost them two and thirty pounds. We shall endeavor to clear up these points for you, and first one or two questions, Mr. Wilson. This assistant of yours, who first called your attention to the advertisement, how long has he been with you? About a month, then. How did he come? in answer to an advertisement was he the only applicant no i had a dozen why did you pick him because he was handy and would come cheap at half wages in fact yes what is he like this vincent spaulding small stout built very quick in his ways no hair on his face though he's not short of thirty has a white splash of acid upon his forehead. Holmes sat up in his chair in considerable excitement. I thought as much, said he. Have you ever observed that his ears are pierced for earrings? Yes, sir. He told me that a gypsy had done it for him when he was a lad. Hmm, said Holmes, sinking back in deep thought. He is still with you? Oh, yes, sir, I have only just left him. And has your business been attended to in your absence? Nothing to complain of, sir. There's never very much to do of a morning. That will do, Mr. Wilson. I shall be happy to give you an opinion upon the subject in the course of a day or two. Today is Saturday, and I hope that by Monday we may come to a conclusion. Well, Watson said Holmes, when our visitor had left us. "'What do you make of it all?' "'I make nothing of it,' I answered frankly. "'It is a most mysterious business.' "'As a rule,' said Holmes, "'the more bizarre a thing is, the less mysterious it proves to be. "'It is your commonplace, featureless crimes which are really puzzling, "'just as a commonplace face is the most difficult to identify.' but I must be prompt over this matter. What are you going to do, then? I asked. To smoke, he answered. It is quite a three-pipe problem, and I beg that you won't speak to me for fifty minutes. He curled himself up in his chair, with his thin knees drawn up to his hawk-like nose. 
and there he sat with his eyes closed and his black clay pipe thrusting out like the bill of some strange bird. I had come to the conclusion that he had dropped asleep, and indeed was nodding myself, when he suddenly sprang out of his chair with the gesture of a man who has made up his mind and put his pipe down upon the mantelpiece. Sarasate plays at the St. James Hall this afternoon, he remarked. What do you think, Watson? Could your patience spare you for a few hours? I have nothing to do today. My practice is never very absorbing. Then put on your hat and come. I am going through the city first, and we can have some lunch on the way. I observe that there is a good deal of German music on the program, which is rather more to my taste than Italian or French. It is introspective, and I want to introspect. Come along. We traveled by the underground as far as Aldersgate, and a short walk took us to Saxe-Coburg Square, the scene of the singular story which we had listened to in the morning. It was a poky little shabby genteel place, where four lines of dingy two-storied brick houses looked out into a small railed-in enclosure, where a lawn of weedy grass and a few clumps of faded laurel bushes made a hard fight against a smoke-laden and uncongenial atmosphere. Three gilt balls and a brown board with Jabez Wilson in white letters upon a corner house announced the place where our red-headed client carried on his business. Sherlock Holmes stopped in front of it with his head on one side and looked it all over, with his eyes shining brightly between puckered lids. Then he walked slowly up the street, and then down again to the corner, still looking keenly at the houses. Finally he returned to the pawnbroker's, and having thumped vigorously upon the pavement with his stick two or three times, he went up to the door and knocked. It was instantly opened by a bright-looking, clean-shaven young fellow who asked him to step in. "'Thank you,' said Holmes. "'I only wish to ask you how you would go from here to the Strand.' Third right, fourth left,' answered the assistant promptly, closing the door. "'Smart fellow, that,' observed Holmes as we walked away. "'He is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest man in London, and for daring I am not sure that he has not a claim to be third. I have known something of him before.' Evidently, said I, Mr. Wilson's assistant counts for a good deal in this mystery of the Red-Headed League. I am sure that you inquired your way merely in order that you might see him. Not him. What then? The knees of his trousers. And what did you see? What I expected to see. Why did you beat the pavement? My dear doctor, this is a time for observation, not talk. We are spies in an enemy's country. We know something of Saxe-Coburg Square. Let us now explore the parts which lie behind it. The road in which we found ourselves as we turned round the corner from the retired Saxe-Coburg Square presented as great a contrast to it as the front of a picture does to the back. It was one of the main arteries which conveyed the traffic of the city to the north and west. The roadway was blocked with the immense stream of commerce flowing in a double tide, inward and outward, while the footpaths were black with the hurrying swarm of pedestrians. It was difficult to realize, as we looked at the line of fine shops and stately business premises, that they really abutted on the other side, with the faded and stagnant square which we had just quitted. "'Let me see,' said Holmes, standing at the corner and glancing along the line. "'I should like just to remember the order of the houses here. It is a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. There is Mortimer's, the tobacconist, the little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the City and Suburban Bank, the Vegetarian Restaurant, and McFarlane's Carriage Building Depot. That carries us right on to the other block. And now, Doctor, we've done our work, 
so it's time we had some play. A sandwich and a cup of coffee, and then off to violin land, where all is sweetness and delicacy and harmony, and there are no red-headed clients to vex us with their conundrums. End of Part 2